completion of the 2011 revolution. So when you see all of these factors combined, right? 70% uh, of people under the age of 30, educated, uh, technologically savvy, able to use new media, full of energy, have a desire for change, and they are determined about it. All of these things kind of really paved the way for the kind of upheaval that we are witnessing, and we will continue to witness, I think, for years to come in this region. So this is one of the young activists. His name is Wael Munim. He was a Google executive, and he became famous for a certain Facebook page. We'll talk about it in a moment. But also, he was detained for 12 days in the midst of the Egyptian revolution, which increased his visibility. Uh, people became aware of who he is, and he had his moment of fame in the midst of the revolution. He is here, uh, shown in the middle of the Tahrir Square, rallying and protesting and calling people to rally and to protest against Mubarak's regime. Together with his friend, Abdul Rahman Mansour, Wa'il Ghunayim and his friend, Abdul Rahman Mansour, created the Facebook page called We Are All Khalid Saeed, which myself and other scholars wrote about. We have written academic articles on this particular Facebook page. This is what the page looks like, the Facebook page where all Khalid Saeed. It is named after this young, handsome gentleman, Khalid Saeed, who was a 24-year-old accountant from the city of Alexandria. His only crime was that he was you know, courageous and brave enough to upload a video on YouTube which revealed some aspects of police corruption, and he paid his life as a price for this. He was dragged from an internet cafe in Alexandria and beaten to death brutally by some of the police officers and security officers. And pictures of his face before and after this brutal attack became very iconic and became a very big trigger for mobilization and political action in the Egyptian revolution. People saw his face before the attack and then they saw very gruesome graphic images of his completely deformed face after the attack and they said, we are all Khalid Saeed. In other words, this is not just about this young man who paid his life. We are all in the same boat. We will not accept this kind of brutality, this kind of humiliation, this kind of violation of human rights anymore. So the page started to have hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands of people became uh, you know, fans of the page. They liked the page and it started to have a very, very big impact on igniting and amplifying voices of protest in the Egyptian revolution. And what about women? Why women's leadership? Where does the role of women or women's leadership also play or come into the picture here? Uh, women's activism in the Arab Spring was very visible. Uh, women played a very visible role in the Arab Spring. Many took part in non-stereotypical gender roles. This is very important. In other words, they were not just nursing, nurturing, or supporting others, but rather they were being in the front lines of resistance themselves, risking their own lives and facing the risk of injury, arrest, or even death. So they were not just like, oh, you know, just helping the man behind the scene. No, no, they were really in the front lines. Many of them fell as martyrs. They paid their own lives for freedom. And many of them were arrested, detained, harassed, you name it. They paid the full price for freedom and for democracy that they were calling for. The selection of the Yemeni journalist and activist, Tawakkul Karman, who came to be known as the mother of the revolution in Yemen, as the first Arab woman to ever receive the Nobel Prize, was actually very significant. It signified the international recognition for women's role in the Arab Spring. So as some scholars, including myself, uh, wrote about this particular important, significant event, we saw it as a nod to the Arab Spring in general, but also a nod to women's role in the Arab Spring in particular. The international community took notice of the role that women played very boldly, very courageously in the midst of the Arab Spring movements. Here is a picture. Again, I love pictures because they're very telling and very powerful. This is a, a very average, um, you know, middle-class Egyptian woman, and she is in the heart of Tahrir Square in the midst of the Egyptian revolution. And Wael Ghunayim, the Google executive I told you about, was detained for 12 days in the midst of the Egyptian revolution. She was holding this banner that said, uh, bring Wael Ghunayim back alive. Another victim of Mubarak's emergency law. Who will be next? So pictures like that of just average middle-class women going out in the street and boldly protesting, holding banners, making their voices heard, asking for change, were very, very powerful and iconic images in the Egyptian revolution. I also have some examples here. This is Nawara Negm. 
She's a prominent blogger uh, and political activist who used her own blog and her own Twitter account in order to rally people and to pave the way for political revolt and upheaval. She is one of the bloggers that I talk about in my book, Egyptian Revolution 2.0, Political Blogging, Civic Engagement, and Citizen Journalism. She is one of the five bloggers who are studied in this particular book. And I should mention here that she was not just active on, uh, you know, on Facebook and Twitter and her blog. She was also very active on the ground, you know, in the heart of Tahrir Square, in many parts of you know, the streets of Cairo. She was there helping people and going out and rallying and protesting. And she has hundreds of thousands of followers on her blog and also her Twitter account. Another iconic young woman who also became a very prominent activist and a very iconic figure in the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution was this young woman, Asma Mahfouz. And I strongly recommend that you look for her vlog. And vlog, of course, is when people blog using video. This is a new terminology. It's vlogging. So she used her own vlog. You can find it on YouTube if you just look for Asma Mahfouz and type the uh, January 25th, 2011 vlog. You can find it on YouTube. I strongly recommend that you watch it because it's very, very powerful and very effective. In this particular vlog, Asma Mahfouz does not just break the political taboos by speaking out courageously and boldly against Mubarak's regime, against the repression and the corruption and authoritarianism and the need to go out and rally and demonstrate. She also breaks social taboos by claiming that women have every right to go out and protest side by side by, with men and attacking the men for saying, oh, what are women doing out there in the street? They should not be on the street. They should not be protesting. So she said in her video or her vlog very powerfully, and instead of blaming women for going out in the street and protesting, why don't you become mad enough to come out in the street, protect the women, and also call for your own rights and protest against Mubarak's repressive regime? So in a very smart and very brilliant way, she was playing on gender stereotypes, turning the tables around, and telling men, and instead of blaming women for going out and protesting and saying this is not socially appropriate, go out, be bold enough, be courageous enough, play your role as a man and as a citizen, and protest and protect the women as well. So very smart breaking of both political and social taboos. And really, uh, women's role in particular in the Arab Spring raises a very important concept, the new concept of cyber feminism. The term cyber feminism refers to a process whereby women deploy new forms of communication, mainly online communication, to advocate for their own rights, causes, and demands, and to fight various forms of discrimination, injustice, or repression. It could be seen or considered as a sister term for the broader term cyber activism. It stresses the role of new media in serving the needs of women and helping their causes. So women are trying to use social media and new media now to raise awareness, not just about political issues like democratization, protesting against the regimes in power, and calling for a transition to democracy and freedom. They're also raising awareness about women's issues, the need for women's representation in political life, their visibility in the public sphere, the rights to have equal uh, you know, political social uh, rights, uh, right for education, for work, uh, also against domestic violence, against sexual harassment, and so on. Very, very strong, very powerful campaigns have been launched and are still continuing to be launched in many parts of the Arab world today. Uh, basically, when women use the cyber feminism process, they used it for three main functions. The functions of mobilization, documentation, and education. Mobilization means rallying support for certain causes which are important for women collecting uh, the needed funds and securing the needed resources to help them. For example, women who have been rape victims or refugees in a country like Syria. We know that this has been a very, very detrimental, tragic humanitarian crisis where there have been many, many uh, hundreds of thousands dead and millions of refugees. Women started to create Facebook pages and online groups in order to raise awareness about what is happening in Syria and how women have lost their uh, you know, male supporters in the family how can we help women who are rape victims? How can we help women who are facing sexual harassment? How can we help women who are refugees and so on? And also documentation, using their own cameras and cell phones and even pens and papers sometimes to show the whole world incidents of brutality, humiliation, and harassment against women. Again, this is the role of citizen journalism 
as we talked about it before, women were using their cell phones. One activist that I interviewed for one of my papers said to me, I always go in the middle of Tahrir Square armed with my cell phone. If I see anyone attacking a woman or harassing her, I simply use my cell phone and my camera as a weapon in the person's face. Right? So this is a very effective weapon to use because the whole world can see this picture in a few seconds. Right? Education. Raising awareness about women's issues and discussing them to increase their significance and visibility in the public sphere. A Syrian radio uh, anchor woman who has her own radio show told me, I'm, to, I'm trying to use my own radio show as an example of positive media to tackle women's issues, to tell people, wake up. Women are half of society and they give birth to the second half of society. They cannot be marginalized, they cannot be ignored, they have to be given their full rights and it's the responsibility of the entire society, both men and women, to give them their rights. So she's using it as a tool for education and for raising awareness about women's issues. However, having said all of this, this is all rosy and beautiful and fabulous, but there have been some changes, unfortunately, in the political and media landscapes in Egypt, specifically after what happened in June 2013, and that deserves some attention. We cannot ignore the fact that there have been some changes on the ground that took place in Egypt since 2013, and they had an impact on both the political and media arena uh, simultaneously. Many Egyptians, including myself, had a lot of very high hopes for Egypt after the ousting of Mubarak in 2011. We said that there's no turning back. The road to democratization and reform has already started and will continue. The transition to democratization needs to be done swiftly but safely. New era of civic engagement and popular participation. Greater role for youth leadership. Greater role for women's participation. Greater role for new media as mobilization tools and enhancing Egypt's leadership in the Arab world and enhancing Egypt's international image and reputation. These were the hopes that many Egyptians, including myself, had for Egypt after the eruption of the 2011 revolution and after the ousting of Mubarak from office. However, the road to democratization or democratic transition and reform in Egypt did not move forward smoothly as hoped for Although the election of Mohamed Morsi as the first democratically elected president in Egypt's history was seen as an important and unprecedented step in Egypt's modern history, he was overthrown on July 3, 2013 in what was described by some as a military coup, by others as a popular uprising, and by some as a popularly backed coup. This led to escalating violence and tension between Morsi's supporters and the army, leaving thousands dead injured and imprisoned. So this is not exactly what Egyptians were hoping for in the post-Mubarak era. This is like a deviation or a derailing, if you will, of the democratic process and a setback to democracy in this uh, very important and strategically significant country. Uh, also here there are now current changes and challenges which are facing Egypt today. These include a shift from solidarity to fragmentation and from plurality to polarization. Let me just explain this point here. Plurality is a good thing. To have diversity and to have plurality, like every one of us in this room can have a different view, a different opinion, this is a positive thing and a good thing. But polarization and fragmentation is not good because it means that people are going to certain polarized, bipolar extremes and they are not very tolerant or accepting of the other. And unfortunately, this is exactly what's happening in contemporary or modern Egypt today. We are seeing now people are taking stands. They're very much against each other. Uh, if you are not with me or against me, my way or the highway, there is this kind of very, very deep division, fragmentation, and polarization, which has some kind of intolerance towards the other. The recycling of the old regime of Mubarak, with all its structures, institutions, and mechanisms, what is sometimes referred to as the deep state, the deep state is a term which means that the uh, well or deeply entrenched institutions of society are very much in place. They have not been shaken, they have not been really uh, completely eradicated. They're very much in place and there is some recycling of this old system as well. The reimposition of the emergency law 
and imposing curfew. We were talking before about the emergency law as being one of the causes of the 2011 revolution. Now, unfortunately, and this is a very dismaying and heartbreaking thing, we are seeing again the emergence or the reimposition of the emergency law and curfew. Curbing freedom of expression and arresting journalists, uh, shocking human rights violations, a return to authoritarianism and military dictatorship, and some people are now asking, are we going back full circle to square one, or as one of my friends uh, bitterly joked about it, from Tahrir Square to one square? In other words, are we recycling everything again, all over again, and starting from scratch? So this is because of the violations that are now happening and the shocking human rights violations and, and return to military dictatorship. Uh, also, the uh, media landscape has been equally changing uh, in Egypt as well. So, the Egyptian media could be seen as both contributors to, as well as reflectors of the highly divided and polarized political scene in Egypt. In other words, some of the channels, unfortunately, on both sides, have been igniting some of these waves of polarization or fragmentation or division between the self and the other, either were motivators for it or reflectors of it or both. Lack of tolerance and acceptance of the other on all sides, a shift from mobilization to polarization. Social media role is different than it was in 2011. They have the most important impact in amplifying voices around a common cause rather than bridging gaps and cementing divisions. And I want to explain this point. When all people had the very same, uh, you know, the very same call or the very same demand, Mubarak must go. Erhal, Erhal, Erhal. Erhal means go, leave. When that was the case, social media and new media amplified the voices of the Egyptian people. When people have the same unified goal, everybody wants the same thing, it is very easy to use social media and new media effectively. And they will amplify the voices of resistance and revolt. But once people start to get fragmented and divided, and they start to have polarized and divided positions, social media can be used as weapons to increase the distance between the self and the other and to increase the fragmentation and polarization. Why? Because people will use social media as weapons against their opponents. So I'm going to use my Facebook page to tarnish my enemies. My enemies and opponents are going to use their Facebook pages and Twitter accounts to uh, label me in a negative way or to tarnish my reputation and it's going to be an endless vicious cycle of hatred and social media can in this case increase the gap and increase the division and polarization even more, unfortunately. Less media freedom, closing down channels, and imprisoning and threatening media people. So if you remember, we were saying earlier, some of these techniques were used by the Egyptian regime during the 2011 revolution, when they were closing down the Al Jazeera office, arresting some of the journalists, preventing foreign journalists, and so on. We are seeing very much the past or the